ಓಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೋರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗು ಸೊ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಆನ್ ದಿ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತ ವಿ ವೇರ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಷನ್ ಧ್ಯಾನ ಯೋಗ ನಾವು ಇನ್ ದಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೂ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಇನ್ಸ್ಪೈರಿಂಗ್ ವೆರಿ ಸೋರಿಂಗ್ ಲಾಫ್ಟಿ ಲಾಫ್ಟಿ ಗೋಲ್ ಜ್ಞಾನ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನ ತೃಪ್ತಾತ್ಮ ದ ನೈನ್ತ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಪೋಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ one is fulfilled completely fulfilled by by gyana and vigyana it depends on how you translate them the conventional the traditional translation is gyana would be the knowledge that we have acquired by shravana and and manana uh, what we have been doing all this time once you get clarity and conviction so that's knowledge but that has to become a living reality vigyana where there is no doubt and where you can actually express it in life you can live it in life you can use that knowledge uh it overcomes suffering uh, it gives you uh, deep fulfillment that is called vigyana so uh, shastra gyana and anubhava the knowledge arising out of scriptural study and inquiry and it's not just reading or attending a few classes but a mastery over it and followed by anubhava which is realization or experience that's one inter- interpretation the other interpretation is gyana itself means that realization you are uh, enlightened you realize aham brahmasmi and vigyana would be a deeper realization where you find the immanence of the divine in in everything that you experience with eyes closed and eyes open you experience the same reality um, as sri ramakrishna says you climb up the stairs to the roof of the house the roof of the house is like you realize brahman the ultimate reality but then you see that what you left behind the staircase and the doors and the windows all of that is made of the same material as the roof of the house the same concrete the same bricks so by 1980 one realizes brahman and then one looks back so that's gyana and then one looks back upon what one had negated one had left behind and you realize all of that is the same divinity um that is so this is the other interpretation of vigyana that would be vigyana a deeper a more full realization but in any case this is the goal whichever way you interpret it this is the uh, final goal and once one realizes that the ninth verse said so this is the eighth verse and then the ninth verse which we read last time i think we were in the ninth verse last time uh, is that true right we were in the ninth verse so you see the same divinity everywhere in a friend and in the so called foe uh, in those who are indifferent in those who are related to you those who are not related to you in all beings in short not just human beings in all beings you see the uh, same divinity and therefore you get sama buddhi and equanimity the sameness which is not so when you in the midst of worldly relationships it, it's definitely the difference is very clear but from the higher spiritual perspective from the perspective of gyana vigyana you have a sama buddhi um, a, a spiritual oneness of everything is realized you feel it you see it directly that and that's the higher truth now to attain this shankaracharya in his commentary says uttama um, uttama phala the highest the finest result uttama phala praptaye in order to attain this this will be said now what are the methods now we are going to enter into the actual instructions on um meditative practices so from verse 10 onwards verse number 10 yogi yunjita satatam atmanam rahasi sthitah ekaki yat chittatma nirashira parigraha the yogi with his mind and uh, self that is the body here subjugated free from desire destitute i don't think if destitute is the right word but without possessions giving up all possessions destitute kind of gives you the impression of a 
like a homeless uh, guy or something. So uh, yes, without possessions uh, and living alone in solitude should constantly concentrate his mind. So here begins a series of instructions on practice. We'll, we'll see later, he'll talk about how to sit, how to um, focus the eyes, how to withdraw the senses, how to concentrate the mind, uh, all these details it will come, to, including the posture of the body and so on, food, uh, rest, all of these things he will talk about, the nitty gritty. Here, the word yogi. So the word yoga coming from the Sanskrit root yuj has multiple meanings. The word yoga in Sanskrit grammar has many, many meanings. Of them, two of them are particular of particular interest in spiritual life. So one is yujir yoga, and the second one is yuj samadho. So one meaning is to, to join, to join the jivatma to the paramatma, to, to join the human to the divine, which is a general way of describing every possible spiritual path, that which takes you to your spiritual goal. So that is yoga in the broadest possible sense. It's number one. And in that sense, bhakti yoga is yoga, karma yoga is yoga, jnana yoga, of course, is yoga. But the second meaning, a more specific meaning of the word, of the root, Sanskrit root, root yoga, yuj, is yuj samadho, meditation. Samadhi in the sense of meditation or concentration. Yogic meditation. So it is in that sense that uh, the word yogi has been used here. Again, Shankaracharya makes it clear that here yogi specifically means dhyayi or dhyani, the one who is practicing meditation. Just a grammatical, semantic point here. Then he says, yunjita, practice, should practice. Certain conditions which empower, make our practices more powerful, he says, um, nirashi aparigraha. Aparigraha means not accepting uh, you know, external possessions, ex objects. It is translated as uh, um, destitute. But anyway, not uh, amassing, not amassing possessions, money, possessions, uh, all of these distract our mind. The more uh, things that you have, especially in the room around you and your own positions. We don't realize it, but our tiny bit of our mind is given there. So the more we have, uh, more cluttered our environment, the more the mind has gone there. When you, it's only when you try to collect the mind together and focus it on one point, especially something as subtle as meditation on the Atman or on the Ishta Devata, your chosen idea. Um, then one realizes how the mind is tied uh, in, in with invisible strings to so many things. Um, so a minimalistic environment is good. Uh, not having possessions. Uh, minimize your possessions, the simplest possible. Also, the more you accept gifts from others, the more it tells on your mind. Uh, I mean, it, there is a kind of subtle obligation. See, as a monk, one can actually totally avoid uh, or as much as possible, avoid uh, taking unnecessary uh, things, which are absolutely not necessary. Um, but as a householder, one cannot totally avoid. You're in the midst of a web of relationships. So people send you Christmas gifts. You can't return them and saying that I'm practicing meditation. I'm not going to take your gifts. Uh, but it has an effect on the mind. I remember this story from Swami Premeshanandaji. So this senior monk of our order, I've referred to him a number of times. He's a disciple of the Holy Mother and considered to be an enlightened person in his lifetime, a Jivan Mukta. So one day, it is narrated by his sevak, his attendant. One day, a gentleman um, came, one of the visitors came to him and wanted to present him with a pine cane, a walking stick. The Swami was old and ill, so it would be a good gift to him. The Swami said, no, I don't need it. And then this gentleman insisted. He said, no, I don't need it. And gentleman understood his psychology. He said, look, I don't want anything in return. I'll just be happy if you take it. I, don't, I really don't expect anything from them. There's no strings, as we would say, no strings attached. No, not even subtle strings attached. No expectations at all in my mind, Swami. I'm just giving it to you. Um, 
Then the Swami said very dramatically, he took the stick and said, all right, you don't expect anything? Then let me break it in, in front of him, you know, as if he's going to snap it in two. And the gentleman looked shocked. And the Swami said, aha, uh, see, there is always a slight expectation in the mind. If somebody, if, you, if the gentleman had walked in and saw the Swami snapping his own uh, walking stick uh, in two, he would have just thought this is an eccentric old man. But the moment I am presenting something to you and it's an expensive thing, I've bought it with affection, love and respect, and you take it and snap it into in front of me, obviously there's a reaction. To that level, one must uh, consider that how much people uh, expect something, even, even uh, in a subtle way. Uh, so these obligations become an, uh, an obstacle in the deeper levels of meditation. Therefore, aparigraha. Aparigraha means not, not accumulating. Literally not accepting gifts, but not accumulating. Um, objects which are uh, useful, which are used for one's gratification. So food and um, you know, things which are beyond one's necessity, just for the pleasure of the tongue. Uh, objects, gadgets, with just for one's entertainment, just for one's... So we surround ourselves with a lot, uh, lot of possessions which have very little connection with our spiritual life. So those are the ones he's talking about. Don't physically collect that. Don't uh, uh, engage. Um, uh, so don't, uh, don't physically collect objects, possessions, which are meant for worldly enjoyment. Then he further qualifies it with nirashi. So not only physically you should not collect these things, nirashi means internally, in the mind, there should not be a desire for that. I may physically be completely uh, without uh, um, uh, any kind of worldly possessions, but internally there may be a feeling that that's a very fine thing. This is a very nice thing. It would be nice to have that. Anyway, I don't want it. But still, it would be nice to have such a thing. So that is an internal desire. The taste for it remains. That has to be given up also. Um, to contemplate objects of the senses with the feeling that these are nice. In Hindi, say mahatva buddhi. These are good, worthwhile. So this creates a taste in that in the mind. And it, it's see what subtle level we are talking about. It pulls the mind outward. It externalizes the mind and increases the struggle when you're trying to meditate. So nirashi means it's the counterpart to the aparigraha, externally not accumulating and internally also um, without the desire for further accumulation, desire for having things in this world. Um, then he says, Atmanam rahasi sthitaha uh, ekaki. So he says rahasi sthita means staying in solitude. So notice he's uh, it's a very monastic or uh, you know like a hermit staying in solitude. And ekaki also again it just means by yourself. The commentator translates as he, he comments saying that not having people to help you around, not depending on other people, not being surrounded by people, ekaki. And rahasi means in solitude. And the commentator says, in caves or in mountains or forests, uh, giri guha adho. Um, Sri Ramakrishna says that meditation, you, you meditate in three things. You know, he plays on the word, mone, bone, kone. So you... In the forest, just like uh, the commentator here said, you can go to the forest or the mountain or a cave in the forest or in a corner of your room, in a corner of your house. Have a corner. It could just be um, one corner of one room, which is dedicated to a little shrine and a little place to sit. Could be sitting on the floor on, on your meditation mat or could be sitting on a chair and with the shrine on your desk. That's enough. He says a corner, but dedicated to meditation. Or he says, even says, in the mind, if you have no solitude at all. I've seen um, monks who are very sick and old in the hospital ward, lying down and the other sick patients around and, and the bustle of a hospital and doctors and nurses coming and going, 
just suffering and sickness all around. But meditating, how? An internal solitude. So inside there is calmness. Inside there is an absolute solitude. There is nobody there. So Sri Ramakrishna says, Mone, Bone, Kone. Bone in the forest. Kone means in the corner. Mone is uh, in your mind. And why not all three? If you get a chance to go to a retreat, uh, if you get a chance to go to an ashram, a meditation center, or even a retreat for three days, a week or more, take that opportunity also. And have a place, a physical place for meditation in your house, in, your, in, your, in a room of your house. And of course, create the feeling of solitude in the mind. That's the most important thing. One non-dualist teacher in, uh, in Uttarakhand, in the Himalayas, you know, they, his advice was, the general uh, sutra or the, the, uh, the core idea was, how do you have a non-dualist attitude in this world? He says, with, uh, first of all, look at this body as a drishya, an object of perception. Just as this book is an object of perception, it's not me. This cloth is an object of perception. It's not me. I am not this. Similarly, this body is an object of perception. Look at this body as you see the bodies of others. You may say it's difficult, but try. I mean, the main objection there would be, unlike objects, unlike the bodies of others, the pains and pleasures, especially the pains um, in this body, they make it mine. So this body responds to my will. And whatever is stimulated here, pain and pleasure, I feel it directly. But you know, those who have heard uh, Drig Drishya Viveka talks, you can apply the principle. You must apply it there also. The pain which is coming, is that not experienced? Of course it's experienced. That's why you call it a pain. If it is experienced, it's an object. It's a subtle object. This is a physical object, gross object. This cloth is a gross object. The skin and bone is a gross object. Uh, even the breath, gross object. But the, uh, as you go inwards, sensations, they're transitional between physical external objects and uh, subtle thoughts and feelings. That's also an object. If the breath is an object, if the sensations are objects, then a thought in the mind, that's also an object. A pain is an object, is a subtle object, an object to consciousness. That's also drishya. So this body with its aches and pains and pleasures and uh, you know, the feelings and sensations, the whole thing is a bundle. It's a drishya. Step one. First step is to distance yourself from this sense of embodiment. Not I in the body, but the body is something I am aware of. It is in my awareness. And then he says, hold on to this. When with eyes closed, that means the, the uh, words he used were very simple. I'm explaining a lot. He just, let me give you, tell you in Hindi, those who understand Hindi, you'll understand, then I'll explain a little more. He says, Sharir ko drishya dekho. Aak band karke nehananasti kinchana. Aak khulne par sarvam khalvidam brahma. It was the instruction. That's all. Three short phrases. So when you see the body and all the sensations associated with the body as drishyan, object, not me, then the next step would be when you withdraw inside. Withdraw inside, he see, literally said with eyes closed. But you know, it does not literally mean just eyes closed. With eyes closed also, we are involved with the world. With eyes open, we are involved with samsara. With eyes closed also, maybe more involved with samsara. So shut out samsara. No world, no people, no body, no thoughts, memories, nothing. Sensations. Shut out the thoughts also to the extent that's possible. Shut out the, the uh, inner chatter, the corresponding, uh, you know, what corresponds to our talking outside, the inner talk. Shut it down as much as possible. Neha nana asti kinchana. There is no multiplicity here whatsoever. This is a famous statement from the Katho Upanishad. No multiplicity here whatsoever. You notice clearly, it is just awareness without object. Non-dual awareness, which I am. That's my core reality. And when I open my eyes, when I engage with the world, when I see, hear, smell, taste, touch, look around, Everything that I see, everyone that I see, uh, every when and everywhere, time, space, object, people, all of that is not one thing more than that non-dual awareness. It is that one non-dual awareness only. 
in which all of these are appearing without really existing. The only thing that exists is that non-dual awareness. This is a lot of explanation. He just said, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. All this is verily Brahman. First, see the body as an object, Drishya. Then with eyes closed, there is no multiplicity here whatsoever. With eyes open, everything is Brahman. Everything is verily Brahman. So, all of this, these are appearances in me, the non-dual consciousness, in I, the non-dual consciousness. And it is that non-dual consciousness, which does not exist as any object whatsoever, but which appears as all objects when your eyes are, when you're engaging with the world. In this world, you are not interacting with anything other than that one divinity. It is Brahman alone. Everybody, everything, every time, every, even the worst of circumstances. Even the most so-called, which we think is the most evil, bad, horrible circumstances is none other than that one divinity. How can the divinity be evil? It is not. Remember, that which appears without existing this is the definition of falsity. Um, that which does not exist and yet it appears. So the so-called evil which we see, the so-called good that we see, it appears, it is experienced, yet it does not exist. Then what exists? Brahman alone exists. And this is, you might say it's paradoxical, but this is the meaning of Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya Jiva Brahma Napara. Brahman alone is real, the world is an appearance, and you are, you the sentient being, are none other than Brahman. This is the practical attitude to take when you withdraw, when you engage. So, for meditation, however, withdrawing is uh, important. No matter how much in non-dual meditation we talk about, the eyes open meditation, eyes closed meditation. But the, pra the practical thing is the yogis are experts in the field of meditation. And they have said withdrawal is important. Sitting down is important. Stillness is important. Cutting up the world is important. Closing the eyes is important. For a long time, in order to focus and to be still, you must withdraw from the world. So he says, Rahasi Sthita, in solitude. In solitude. In, in uh, solitary places. Physically solitary. Uh, at least um, also away from other people. Ekaki, by yourself. Without having you know, uh, people to help you around. I've seen so many such uh, meditators, monks in the mountains. In caves, uh, one I found at least one or two in a hole in the ground, literally in a hole in the ground. <laughs> Wonderful. But it was just too dark. I crawled into the hole with him. I and a friend, another monk were a friend who was a friend. So this monk invited us into his hole in the ground. I said, there's a wonderful cave nearby, just above, just a few paces you walk. Uh, why don't you stay there? And he said, no, that there's a bear there. And the bear is a, is a sort of a bully. So he won't let me stay. So these are ekaki, in solitude, cut off from everybody else. Now, Shankaracharya, in his commentary here, he makes up his pitch for sannyasa, monasticism. He says, ekaki, a further ex um, comment on this, rahasi, that means in solitude, ekaki by yourself, uh, a rahasi means in a lonely, uh, solitary place, and ekaki by yourself in solitude. He puts them together. And he says, sannyasam kritva, taking monastic vows. So, see, there is actually no direct reference to being a monk in this verse. But uh, Shankaracharya is a great supporter of monasticism. So, wherever he gets an opportunity, he uh, gently pushes for monasticism. He says here, uh, maybe you could become a monk. He just gently puts the uh, suggestion. Ekaki rahasi sthita, becoming a monk. And therefore, he later on says, when he talks about aparigraha, not accepting, he connects it to monasticism. Becoming a monk, and on top of that, not accepting uh, uh, unnecessary things, or not accepting gifts or possessions. So by becoming a monk also, where you give up uh, money and possessions and relationships, and you're a solitary meditator, but monks also can accumulate a lot. Sometimes um, you will find astonishing amount of uh, positions 
in a monk's uh, room or a cottage because householders are generous, so they keep giving things. I knew this monk, wonderful old Swami. He lived to be 104. But he had no, he had a room in that ashram. And uh, it was very well known. He had no place to stay in the room because it was full of gifts. So he used to sleep on a bench outside his room. Very austere Swami. He, uh, so he, he was, pr- and he was proud of his austerity. At the age of nearly 100, he would sleep without a pillow or a bed, just on a hard wooden bench. And uh, this takes me back. The first time I met him, that was in 1994, I think. He was visiting the ashram where I was a novice. And I, I just heard this very senior Swami is visiting, who's nearly 100. At that time, he was in his 90s. As a disciple of Swami Saradananda. And he has been blessed he, by meeting six of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. He would... He was quite a character. He would say, on this head, uh, this head has been touched by the hands of the six direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. <laughs> I have no fear. He would do like this. I have no fear at all. Uh, and when he was, the first time I saw him, he was climbing the stairs to the temple in our ashram, which is quite a, uh, you know, like pretty high, multiple flights of stairs. I thought the old Swami, maybe I should help him up. I asked one of the other Swamis who knew this one, Swami and said, who oh, he's the Swami who's visiting. Should I go up, uh, run up and uh, you know, offer help? And the other Swami burst out laughing. He said, oh, you don't know him. He'll carry you up. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's very strong. And so one interesting thing about him was that uh, he, liked, uh, he liked umbrellas, I think caps and uh, sandals, I think. So his room was full of that. But everybody knew that he liked that. So everybody would give him an umbrella and a cap and a, and a pair of sandals. And we also gave him when he came to the ashram. And he whispered back, how do you know? And we said, everybody knows. And, <laughs> um, and another funny thing about this Swami was he had dentures, you know, like false teeth. And he was grumbling that, Apparently, there's a rat which lived in his room and the rat stole his dentures. I think the rat also must be very old, you know. So he wanted a replacement set of dentures. He had this apparent running battle with the rat. The rat would take away his dentures and he would <laughs> get it back from that rat. Um, so yes, Shankaracharya comments, and being a monk on top of that, don't accept gifts. Um, just uh, stay without any possessions. And then he says, Satatam, continuously be engaged in spiritual practices, in, in meditation. Yata chittatma, this phrase is interesting. Chitta means uh, mind. Atma here does not mean the self, I mean the conscious, mean pure consciousness self. It means the bodily self, the physical body. So body, mind under control. Having rejected external possessions, clearing uh, your mind of desires for external enjoyment, enjoyment of things in the world. Now keep your body mind under control so that the whatever will be done from now onwards, from this time onwards, l- do not engage in activities for the sake of personal gratification or pleasure. Personal ple- pleasure seeking, you see a lot of our activities are like that. From taking a cookie, you will find that <laughs> so many things we do just because it feels good, which have no really no direct connection with our spiritual life. And we take away time and energy and condition the mind. Now, this might be a very strict rule that you will not do anything which is meant for your own personal uh, you know, pleasure or gratification. We may do some things, but then they're also connected to God. So there's a cookie which I like. Fine, it is very clearly for the gratification of my tongue. All right, if you're not going to give it up, at least when you uh, eat it, mentally offer it to the Lord and take it as prasada. So connect it. Let our activities be yoga, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, dhyana yoga, jnana yoga, as much as possible. All our activities in the world also, if you have a job and a house and a family to take care of, those every activity can be offered to the Lord mentally. then those will not bind and those will not disturb us at the time of meditation. 
This is called Yata Chittatma, having the body mind under control. So this is the verse. Yogi, the meditator, Yunjita Satatam, being con continuously engaged. So it, the way of meditation uh, demands a lot of time and effort. Hours and hours of our time and a very calm and retired and uh, inward life. Ekaki Rahasi Sthita, in, by yourself, in solitary places, being established or staying there. And you know, Shankaracharya's additional comment there that uh, you could consider becoming a monk, keeping your body mind under control, um, internally not grasping, not wanting, uh, externally not accumulating. So if, you, if we engage a body mind, in pleasure seeking activities or in just you know casual activity without any any spiritual purpose what happens is at the level of body they say it's alasya um, this alasya means laziness either the body falls prey to laz laziness or comfort seeking the senses become addicted to their particular objects to see nice things to hear nice things uh, to taste nice things to touch nice things and smell all of these things the senses keep on engaged with their objects. These are what I like. And at the level of the mind, the mind will dwell on these objects, how to get these, how, or how nice it is to, that enjoyment which I had, that thing that I saw, uh, that thing that I ate, or you know, the whole adver advertising industry is working day and night to fill these thoughts in our minds. How nice it would be to buy this thing, to have this experience, to possess that thing. Um, so the mind dwells on that. Or the mind will have a habit of turning away to no purpose. It's just general, the general chatter of the mind. So that can be avoided if we have this yata chittatma. Engaged in spiritual activity, that is something connected to a spiritual life, and desisting from something that is not connected or just plain pleasure seeking. Now more practical. Uh, instructions verses 11 onwards shucho deshe pratishthapya sthiram asana matmanaha nati uchritam nati nicham chaila jina kushottaram in a clean spot fixing his seat firm neither too high nor too low made of the kusha grass skin and cloth one on top of the other Sitting on that, with the activities of the mind and the senses controlled, concentrating his mind, he should practice yoga for the purification of the mind. So first of all, Shucha Udeshe, in a clean spot. So clean, as the commentator says, um, either clean by nature, so it is a naturally beautiful, clean place, or a meditation room which has been cleaned. So either cleaned by nature or by one's efforts. So Bhavata Samskarava. So either cleaned just by, it's a naturally beautiful spot, good for meditation, or you have made it so by your efforts, like a meditation hall, for example, or just the corner of your room which you have uh, set up for meditation. That's a pure spot. Um, steady. The place must be steady and therefore not too high. Not too low. I don't know exactly why not too low. There are many, there are many subtle aspects to all of this. For example, the asana, the meditation mat itself, the descriptions here. There are many subtle aspects to it. I don't know much about that, nor am I particularly interested. But it's not as plain as it seems. You know, just neither too high nor too low. But there are subtle psychological uh, aspects to having a bouncy seat, for example. Don't. Uh, or a seat which is sort of giddily high. Even if you close your eyes, you will still feel it, that you are not settled properly. It's completely at floor level. Maybe you're, I don't know if insects are going to disturb you or something. <laughs> but still, not only that, there's, there are certain aspects of being completely at the floor level without anything to, uh, between you and the hard floor or the dirt floor or whatever it is. So it neither too high nor too low. And then he says how you should construct your meditation mat also. Chaila jina kushottaram. 
so cloth and a deer skin and um, the kusha grass and the commentator says in the reverse order so the kusha grass is first on the floor and on top of that the deer skin and on top of that the cloth usually a silk cloth now again don't go all that um, into you know be very particular about how the meditation mat is to be is to be constructed this is used to be a running joke among young monks you know i can't meditate properly because i don't have a deer skin or a tiger skin i'm sure the you know the prevention of cruelty to animals or the, or the animal the conservationists would have a word or two to say against this just a comfortable uh, mat but it's important to have a mat for meditation and have a personal one don't let others use it that's more important and uh, be comfortable with it and uh, use it what else is important here okay the next verse which we read together i think 11 and 12 we read the translations together now what do you do once you have got the mat you obviously you meditate verse number 12 Tatraikagram mana kritva yata chittendriya kriya upavishyasane yunjad yogam atma vishuddhai. I read the translation of this along with the earlier one. But there, sitting down on that, and how you will sit also, he will talk about that later. There, you focus your mind on the, sitting on that mat, uh, controlling the senses. And the mind that means we drawing the senses from their uh, respective objects practice yoga of meditation atma vishuddhai for the purification of the mind now the mind is also already purified to some extent by our our karma yoga and bhakti yoga this is a higher purification in it consists on what what impurity is removed by meditation the impurity is distraction if you look at distraction as an impurity the scatteredness of the mind is an impurity to remove that impurity is called atma vishuddhai the further purification the deep deeper purification of the mind and then how do you sit is going to talk about the posture you have the mat now you are ready to sit how do you sit 13 samam kaya shiro grivam dharayan achalam sthiraha samprekshya nasika gramsvam so holding the body the trunk the head and the neck um, in erect in one line that means not you can't physically make it one geometric line somebody said it's uh, if you just imagine a plumb line coming from the ceiling and going through your head through your body down so as if you are being suspended on that line then your Uh, shoulders your spine your neck your head will all gently settle into the proper alignment it's erect and aligned not rigid not loose if if we sit slumped we immediately see the effect on our mind it is physically unhealthy and immediately the effect on our mind also one can immediately see um, you can easily feel depressed uh, you cannot concentrate so well so it's much it's better to have a proper posture especially if you're going to meditate for a long time and remain steady there um dharayan achalam achalam means sthiraha steady not moving this not moving is important imagine the mind is like water in a bowl imagine a bowl a ceramic bowl filled to the brim with water now you are holding it if it's filled to the brim how carefully you have to hold it how motionlessly you have to hold it so that even one drop doesn't spill and how much more steady you have to be so that there are no ripples or movements on the surface remember the surface is to the brim of the bowl so how careful now imagine sitting like that not rigid if you're rigid you can't avoid moving after some time you'll get tired relaxed but not slumping not slouching straight Uh, relaxed so that you can hold that for a long time but uh, very still i mentioned this earlier i have seen 
monks who are very good at meditation, uh, deep meditators, many meditators of many years. And one remarkable feature about them is the stillness, especially when they're sitting for meditation. It seems they radiate, they're not only still physically, but they radiate that stillness around them. I mean, even the environment somehow feels um, deeper, more silent. So he says here, uh, achalam sthiraha, not moving, steady. Eyes, the gaze of your eyes, he says, sampreksha nasika gram swam, dishascha navalokayan. Uh, gaze at the tip of your nose and do not look around in the directions. Now, Shankaracharya in his commentary makes a good deal of this, I think half humorously. He said the point is not to gaze at the tip of your nose because if the point were to gaze at the tip of your nose, your mind would be on the tip of your nose. He literally says that. Your mind would be on the tip of your nose uh, but and not on the Atman. So gaze on the tip of your nose means to keep the gaze locked down so that it does not uh, waver. We know, even modern neuroscience tells us, how much of our cognitive capacity is tied up with our visual sense organs. So the moment you open your eyes, um, it seems areas of the brain light up, a lot of activities there. Our attention is pulled. That much we can experience immediately. Our attention is immediately pulled outwards the moment we open our eyes. If you close, then close the eyes, if you close the eyes, the uh, signal to the mind is to fall asleep. Generally, when we close our eyes for a long period of time, the mind has been trained to think, oh, this guy wants to fall asleep. Okay, I'm going to go to sleep. So the way was to keep your eyes half open and then instead of looking around, keep your eyes, the gaze downwards. But the gaze downwards is not to gaze downward. If you're actually seeing something, what you're seeing will go to your mind. You're not seeing the tip of your nose. So it is just an unseeing open gaze. Though it is not, that is not what is meant here, but I'll also add here, there's a peculiar gaze of those who are centered in the self or in God. Especially at the moment when they are like a Sahaja Samadhi or a Samadhista gaze. If their eyes are open, then you can see. The only way to describe it is the person's... Um, Attention is focused on something transcendent, something within. Eyes are open, but they are not seeing. And there's a luminosity to the gaze, lumin luminosity to the face. I've seen this um, in a few advanced uh, practitioners. And you can see it in um, the gaze of um, you know, Swami Vivekananda and many others. The pictures that are there, photos are there, great masters. Um, I've seen a video of a Tibetan master who has passed away now. So he's talking, but he's giving instructions. But once in a while, he goes into this little, the only way I can call them are mini samadhis. And you can see that eyes become fixed on something within. Sri Ramakrishna gave an example of a bird uh, sitting on its eggs. So the eyes of the bird sitting on its eggs. So the attention is entirely on the eggs. Eyes are open, but it's, uh, the attention is entirely there. In fact, he asked somebody to draw that picture for him. Um, I don't know how better to describe it. But that's at the level where the one is absolutely centered in the Atman or in God, if you are a devotee. It's, uh, the person is not really aware of the external world, nor of the body, nor of one's mind of a reality beyond body-mind and the attention is focused there. If the eyes are closed, you can't see it, but if the eyes are open, it's quite remarkable. There's nothing quite like that gaze. But that's, of course, the, um, at the higher end of the spectrum. Here, the idea is not to look around. So he makes it clear, dishas chanava lokayan, not looking around in the, in the directions. The commentator says, once in a while, sitting quietly, meditating, and once in a while, looking around, what's going on? What others are doing? Who's sleeping? Uh, what time is it? When can I get up? All those things. Don't do that. I've told this earlier, a very funny story about a novice. So novices get up to all sorts of mischief. 
and this novice um, monk, he was very energetic. So sitting quietly for hours together is just the worst kind of punishment you could give him. But you're a monk, what else can you do? So you're sitting quietly and in this great hall where with early in the morning at 4 a.m. with hundreds of other monks. And he found a junior novice, somebody who was junior to him, who was uh, obviously drowsy, he was doing like this. And this novice, he tapped him on the back and you know, whispered, sit straight, you. And the other novice thought, oh, all right, so he's a senior novice, maybe uh, he's right to correct me, see, sat straight. And every time that novice uh, felt sleepy, this one at the back would tap him, sit straight. That became his meditation. The next day, he found that this other junior novice was nowhere to be seen. And when he started sitting for meditation, he had changed his meditation seat. I think the, in, this continuous uh, moment to moment, uh, you know, hand holding or meditation holding was becoming difficult to. <laughs> So this novice wouldn't give up. In the semi-darkness of that hall, he got up stealthily and he looked around to see where that other novice was. And he found him. And he went and sat down next to him, just behind him. And he continued his instructions to keep him meditating. A couple of days later, that novice was not to be seen in the entire hall. And this one would not give up. So he went outside the hall and searched outside. It's a huge temple. Sometimes people sit outside uh, the hall, um, in the, under the open, on the stone uh, platform of the, of the um, temple, but uh, under the open sky sometimes. And he found this uh, young novice behind a pillar. And so he went and sat down next to him. And the story continued. After a few days, the novice was nowhere to be found in the whole temple. And then he went in search of him and found him by the bank of the Ganga River, sitting there to escape his tormentor, his, his meditation instructor, the most dedicated meditation instructor. So this is a, a case of uh, trying to make others do, you know, like so vicarious meditation. I'm sacrificing my meditation so that you can become spiritual. The, there was a great, a very scholarly senior monk who was a master of the novices there. And uh, our rule was you have to sit still there for one hour at least. That's the minimum. You can't come away from the temple meditation hall before one hour is over. So if somebody thought, maybe I can go in a little early, take a quick 10-minute nap before the next thing, which is chanting from the uh, Upanishads or the hymns. So you gather your meditation mat and you trudge back to the, uh, the hall there you, you live. And there the old Swami is standing with one of those old clocks. You know, this in India we used to have them, which go tring and they're big metal clocks and go tick-tock. And he would, he would not speak. It was very quiet. So he would just thrust the clock in your face like this. See, which point being that it's not yet one hour. Back you go to the, to the temple. And he would turn around helplessly. What could you say? No word was exchanged. But everybody understood what was going on. And the young novices would grumble. I wonder when, when does he meditate? He's always uh, <laughs> on to us. Disha's Chanavaloka and not looking around in the directions. Once in a while, commentator says. Then what happens? In the 14th verse, it says, Prashantatma vigata bhi brahmachari vrate sthita mana sangyam yamachitto yukta asita matpara Prashantatma with the mind uh, deeply peaceful. I'll explain this later. What does it mean, deeply peaceful? Vigata uh, beyond fear. Brahmachari vate sthita. Uh, in general, it means uh, being established in the vow of the brahmachari, the novice spiritual seeker. Or specifically, it means celibacy. Mana sangyamya, controlling the mind. Mat chitta, giving the mind to me, to God. Yukta asita, being engaged in meditation, sitting in meditation, matpara, considering me to be the highest. So to quickly break down what was what's given here, prashantatma. Shanta means peaceful. Prashanta means a deeper peace. So it works like this. Um, the first level at which we lose our peace is um, when 
I am disturbed about something in the world, especially my activities. If things go badly, but I feel I've done my best, that's fine. It does not really disturb me. But if there's something that I have done or said or thought which goes against my standards, my morality, I feel disturbed as guilt and uneasiness. So the first level of peace is the transition from um, unethical or immoral uh, life to moral and ethical life. Um, in um, the Vedantic terms, transition from adharma to dharma. So that's the first step. Now, moral and ethical, one can still be moral and ethical and uh, be completely worldly, not particularly spiritual. And there are many such very good people who are not interested or agnostic about spirituality, certainly are not med meditators, uh, but they are moral and ethical. The next level of peace, deeper level of peace is, not only am I dharmic, not only am I moral and ethical in my actions and my behavior in society, but also selfless, also altruistic. So the actions that I do are not only moral and ethical, but then I'm not looking for anything, uh, any, any worldly gain or pleasure from those actions. It is done for the welfare of others. It's done as a duty, uh, could be in the family, in the community, in the, or to people whom I have no connection with. So again, in the technical term would be moving from the, or rising from dharmic action to a higher level, which is karma yoga. You see, what's the difference between dharmic action and um, karma yoga? Dharmic action is you may chase money and pleasure, but within the limits of morality and decency, that's dharmic. There's nothing wrong with it. But that is sakama with desire. That still keeps us tied to samsara, a better samsara, a more sustainable samsara, a more decent moral samsara, but still samsara, still open to uh, change and uh, suffering and um, transience. And then you rise from that to the, the karma yoga, where I'm doing, I'm engaged in action, but I have no axe to grind. My only goal is God realization. I'm not really doing it to enrich my, the goal is not to enrich myself. The goal is not to um, seek pleasure and so on. The goal is God realization. So moving from dharmic action to karma yoga, a deeper level of peace. When I am working with this attitude of karma yoga, there's a natural peace which comes. You sleep happily. Somehow you are not entangled with the world anymore. You can do a lot of work and it, it does, it, you can carry it very lightly. I have seen this many times. As monks, uh, the last 20, 25 years I've seen those who do it in the right spirit schools, um, hospitals, relief activities, enormous institutions dealing with hundreds of people, difficult dealing with people of all sorts and pretty happy and relaxed and light. Um, so that is karma yoga. So that's the kind deeper kind of peace. An even deeper kind of peace comes when not just externally your karma yogi, but internally the mind is given to God. You think about God, you read about God, the devotional uh, attitude. Your, your mind is pulled to God, what he calls here matchitta. Matchitta means mind, the thoughts which come from moment to moment throughout the day. Many of them, a lot of them are concerned with God, with your Ishta Devata or in some form. You understand what I'm talking about, bhakti. That gives a lot of uh, peace, a higher level of peace. Beyond that is what he's talking about now. That is. At some time, even uh, devotional thoughts, pure devotional thoughts, even that ceases. At least a couple of times in a day, shut down everything. In, enjoy the deepest possible silence. You have no entanglements with the world. Your attitude is altruistic and selfless. Mind is given in devotion to the Supreme. And then you shut it all down. All those thoughts, altruistic thoughts, devotional thoughts, everything shut down in meditation. So that is the even deeper uh, piece which he is talking about. Prashantatma. There is something even deeper than this. The, the piece which comes from knowledge, from jnana, enlightenment. That's higher than this also. But the, here it is called Prashantatma. Free of fear. Brahmachari vrate sthita. So the commentator here says Brahmachari vrate sthita means following the discipline of a Brahmachari, serving the teacher, um, you know, following the daily routine of a novice. 
so that's a general sense of being a brahmachari one who has taken the vows of brahmacharya being a spiritual novice um, specifically celibacy and then again would would be different for for a householder and different for a monastic brahmachari vrate sthitaha mat chitta mat para two words mat chitta means mind given to me mat para means considering me to be the highest these two things are these are these are two important clues of our attitude towards god mat chitta means moment to moment i will think about god the thoughts which come to my mind what are they about are they about samsara or are they about god or the supreme self they are about god or the supreme self it is mat chitta the mind turned inwards to the reality within in devotion to god or in knowledge focused on the witness consciousness beyond body and mind which i am then it is mat chitta because what can happen otherwise is um, i make up my mind i am a spiritual seeker i am uh, my go- goal is god realization that's the highest goal of um, of uh, human life fine and then throughout the day are you how much time are you spending in thinking about god most of the time not most of the time i'm thinking about all sorts of other things and therefore when i sit down in meditation all those other things crowd into my mind the reverse should be true when we are in sitting in meditation all thought of samsara must be shut out and swami turiyan ji says that you put a notice board on your chest which says no admission he literally meant it visualize it no admission not one thought about samsara about body about my personal life none of it will be admitted only my lord is admitted there that's it the ishta devata ishta mantra that is admitted there nothing else and this is something you have to do moment to moment because the distractions are coming moment to moment that is called mat chitta in that requires throughout the day also in some way to connect our activities our talk our thoughts throughout the day to god that's why karma yoga upasana these are very useful which keeps god as a kind of background hum throughout our day then it becomes much easier to meditate uh, much easier to give our mind totally to god during meditation the other way around mind is totally scattered in the totally scattered in the world throughout the day and then i try to withdraw and sit down in meditation difficult that's where the struggle happens the world will intrude what you have in, immersed the mind in throughout the day that color the mind has taken and you will feel it in the time of meditation i have seen it um, in many wonderful in the day to day lives of many wonderful monks uh, how throughout the day in many ways they have evolved strategies in the long monastic life either they repeat the mantra they keep keep the pictures around them once in a while you know like a slight bow to thakur or ma in the or they take out a book and t- read it for 2 minutes or uh, break the routine of the day by going to the temple a number of times specific number of times in a day whatever is going on a short visit to the prayer hall or the, or the temple and sit for 5 minutes and come back something or the other they are keeping a background awareness of the ishta devata of the mantra alive so that in time of meditation it becomes quite easy so that is called mat chitta the movements of the mind chitta vritti movements of the mind must be concerned with god in some way with the ishta devata with the mantra or vedantic analysis um this is saying asupte amrite kalam nayet vedanta chintaya till you fall asleep always possible in vedanta till you fall asleep till you die keep uh, spend your time in vedantic thoughts so till the point we fall off to sleep we go to sleep till the time death comes keep your mind engaged in vedantic thought you can do that uh, that is mat chitta mat para means um, considering me that means god atman brahman whatever is your f- focus considering me to be the highest uh, what i re- regard as the greatest the most supreme thing in my life both must go together how can uh, how is it possible for one to be there without the other as i said one might consider god realization to be the highest goal i agree totally but throughout the day i am astonished and alarmed to find i am not thinking much about god or god realization so that mat mat para is there but mat chitta is not there 
the other way around is also possible and shankaracharya here gives a, a slightly non monastic example he says consider the case of a man who has fallen in love with a woman so his thoughts are continuously on the woman so mat chitta is a, the thoughts are uh, on that woman but he does not consider that woman to be the supreme so he gives an example he may consider the king to be the supreme power or he may consider god he says raja mahadev acha you may consider god to be the supreme power but it should not be like that when you are talk, you're meditating on god or on the atman keep your mind there and keep the conviction that this is the highest so these two go together i think we have run out of time more instructions are going to come about sleep about food all these things uh, there are comments alpana says while focusing on ishta if the image keeps changing and the mind observes eyes feet hands facial expressions the mind focused or not yes it is focused it is focused um in fact the guru will tell you you can rotate your attention see tie the, the secret to meditation is this tie the uh, attention down in time space object desha kala vastu so for this period of time for the next 30 minutes if you are used to meditating on the heart lotus say for the next 30 minutes my mind will not leave the heart lotus this is the space it will stay there if that is too difficult you have a picture of sri ramakrishna for example or your chosen deity now my eyes my thought will not leave the frame of that picture it could move you giving it freedom to move around in that picture but it will not go there there here or there mind will not go outside that picture think about mind going outside the picture means bringing in thoughts of something else other than that picture so you can use a external picture also in fact somebody said to the holy mother ma sharada that uh, meditation is difficult for me the mind keeps is is fickle keeps wandering so she said my child if you look at the picture of thakur that is as good as meditation the time of meditation you just sit quietly and look at the picture of thakur it's as good as meditation this actual reproduction of the the body of an avatar and it is a very high state of samadhi sri ram krishna himself said so that picture so that is keeping the mind fixed in space then keeping the mind fixed in time for the next 30 minutes starting now till that end of these 30 minutes the mind will not um, think of anything else except the mantra and the ishta devata this space mind will not not go outside this space this time the mind will not think of anything else you have tied down the mind in time and space then tying down the mind in object so the image which you are visualizing and the, the mantra which you are repeating these are the objects to which the mind is tied now so desha kala vastu see the philosophy of it is very wonderful the reality which we are all seeking transcends time space and object desha kala vastu parichheda shunya there is no time when it is not it is always eternal there is no space where it is not it is sarva vyapi and there is nothing in this universe which it is not then why are you tying down the mind because you it is too difficult for us to <laughs> think about it in that way if you cannot keep your mind as that if you try to think about it in that way infinite in time space and object then your mind itself will disappear only brahman will remain but if that is a far goal for all of us then you make a beginning by instead of scattering the mind in space in time among many objects lock it down in object lock it down in a period of time lock it down in in a enclosement of space this is the technology of meditation yeah. bindu says holy mother is the gaze in the photo that you're talking about yes in i think almost all her photos um yesterday i was seeing photos of anandamayi ma you know anandamayi ma who was uh, there um, she was a very simple lady from east bengal a devotee of krishna but uh, extraordinary i don't know much about her little bit i've read i was looking at the photos many of her photos very very obviously there is no you don't even have to make an effort just look at her eyes 
in many of the photos, you will see the eyes of a God-realized saint and sort of effortlessly shining forth. And she had that ability to you know, easily move between uh, non-dualism and dualism. Somebody asked her that uh, jnana and bhakti, many of these dialogues are actually recorded. You can hear them. And in very simple Bengali, she talks. Simple Bengali accented Hindi, she, and she talks. Uh, she says, she was asked, is jnana and bhakti the same? He says, yes, of course. Because the object, the, the, that which you are trying to catch hold of is the same. And therefore, jnana and bhakti are the same. And then she says, look at how perceptive. She says, if you do not catch hold of the object, then the jnana and bhakti become very different. <laughs> if, you ca- if you catch hold of that object, call it God or Atman, then jnana and bhakti are the same. They are, you can see that in two different ways, you are enjoying the same thing. If you miss that object, then the two paths are very different. He says, he says they will become different then. And I noticed in most of her questions and answers, she is established in non-dualism and bhakti at the same time, very easily. Sort of overflowing with a childlike, simple joy, radiance, sweetness, which is, which is what attracted most people. But with the flame of non-duality burning very clearly inside. She keeps saying, but there's my child, there are not two. There's always that one. Uh, our professor Arindam Chakravarti met her a long time ago. He had accompanied his guru, uh, the great sadhu Sitaram Das Onkarnath, who had gone to meet Arandamaima. So at, during her lifetime, many of the greatest uh, spiritual teachers, both within Hinduism, outside also, uh, they came to meet her. So... Uh, Anandamai Ma said, uh, Baba, do niye to dunia. Dunia, the word, so this is a play uh, you find in Bengali, Hindi, you can understand, but it's difficult to translate into English. Dunia literally means samsara, yeah. the world. But she makes a play on words. Dunia, do means two. Where there is two, there is samsara. You give up the two, no, no samsara. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you are right. That gaze you see in Ma Sharada, you can see in the pictures of um, the photos of uh, Ananda Maima also. I met this great scholar about 20 years ago. I don't think he's alive anymore. Govinda Gopal Mukhopadhyay. A very great scholar. He used to visit uh, our Ramakrishna Mission Ashram in uh, Gold Park in Calcutta. So there was a conference on spiritual experience on... Uh, Samadhi and spiritual experience like that. And uh, he was this very impressive speaker. He was in his 80s and a booming voice, you know, a voice which does not require a microphone. So when it was his turn to speak, till that time we talked about all the scholars and uh, the presenters were talking about Samadhi and spiritual experience, you know, the psychology of it, the philosophy of it. You know, we're talking very abstruse terms. And he, he came, he, he started off, he's saying, no abstraction, most vivid physical reality of God experience. That one, you, the world today knows as in the booming voice, world today knows as Anandamai Ma. I was a child, I played in her lap. Day in and day out, I saw her. She would feed me, I would bathe me as, as if she was a little kid. He was, the, he was their neighbor when they were in Bangladesh. And on and off, I saw her going into samadhi, into ecstatic states, just spontaneously. So for me, all these things you are talking about here, none of, none of it is at, at all abstract or abstruse or subtle. It's, it's a vivid, concrete reality for me. And he said it, the old man said it with so much conviction. I, uh, I still remembered that. Then Sudhir... Saying for householders, spiritual practice brings dispassion towards the world and world's goals. It leads to no action for personal gain in conflict with family goals. How do you balance duties versus spiritual growth as a spiritual house, householder? It may be a little difficult, but consider whatever you do, like a job, uh, accumulating money, maintaining your property, your house, educating your children, all of the, this can be done as a spiritual practice. Inter, it makes a it requires an internal shift, a paradigm shift. 
I am not doing these things for gratification. By these things, I'll be fulfilled and happy. I know it will not work. Nobody till today has ever become fulfilled by these things. One may, if you lead a good, moral, uh, active householder's life, you reach some kind of fulfillment, but no absolute fulfillment. It's not possible in samsara. But absolute fulfillment is possible in enlightenment, in God realization. So I convert those activities. See, if Arjuna could convert warfare into karma yoga, that's the worst, nastiest form of human activity, then we can convert um, any, any of our uh, duties. Duties are always moral. None, none of the duties are immoral. So you can convert them into spiritual practice. Internal shift is required. And time. Swami Vivekananda says, the ancient monarchs who were absolute monarchs with tremendous responsibilities and tensions and all, you know, they found time for this philosophy. Compared to them, uh, we, have, we have enormous amounts of time. It's just an excuse to say that we don't have time. Uh, if we want to, why only five ideals? We can put 50 ideals into practice in our lives if, if we want. Then, so somebody, uh, Rick has shared a picture of Andamind. Yes, you see this, uh, if you click on that, and if you see the expression in the face, you will see, especially the eyes. You see the eyes are not centered, in, they are open, but they are not seeing anything in the world outside. They are completely, uh, it shows an inward gaze. This is what Sri Ramakrishna called, like the bird sitting on its, uh, on its eggs. The eyes are open, but not gazing at anything particularly. Why I mentioned her particularly, I've seen it in many other cases also, but uh, her particularly because it's so many pictures are available and, and it's so very obvious in her case. Then Paramahamsa Yogananda met her, and many others. Then Vishwanathan says, regarding consider me as the highest when we are in the world, day-to-day -day activities, we tend to forget this and give overwhelming importance to worldly concerns. How can one build this conviction? Keep it in your heart. Somebody said, when you take care of a child, like a baby, you are doing so many things. You are cleaning the clothes, you are preparing food, you are setting up the house, making it baby-proof. So many activities which need to be done so well. But the heart is with the baby. The mind has to be given to this kind of work, uh, but the heart can remain with, uh, with God. So the purpose of all of this work, you have changed the purpose of all the activities which demand your full attention. I understand when you are doing a demanding job in your corporate life or in your, uh, in your medical profession, it demands attention, energy, time, and you have nothing left over for anything else. Fine, but be clear that that is your puja. That is the worship that you are giving up to the Lord. The purpose of that is God realization. Keep your mind on the means, but understand that the end is, you have made up your mind that the end is God realization. Very good. And practically, at least a couple of uh, times in a day uh, to withdraw from all activities and say, you know, one Swami, Madhavanandaji, who was the general secretary and later president of our orders, is very practical. Practical spirituality, you had to learn from him. He said, work is, worship is fine, but that's a very high thing. First, work and worship. So take worship seriously. Give time, energy, space. Now, this is worship time. And work. Then next level will be work as worship. And only finally, ultimately, work is worship. You're seeing Brahman everywhere. That, that is, that's the highest. All right. So work and worship, work as worship, work is worship. <laughs> Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu